Yeah, I don't think I've reacted to any Jordan Peterson, but I do love Jordan Peterson. And I do want to. I will start like going into more of his stuff. But this one's about the Queen. It just come off my thing, so I thought seeing as yeah, she died. I haven't done anything about the Queen. I don't really know that much about the Queen, to be honest. Which might be shocking for people outside of <laughs> the UK to know, but I don't really know that much about them. They live down the road from me as well. They don't live that far from me. But, um, but yeah, Jordan Peterson comments on the Queen's passing and how her death will change the world. But yeah, let's go. How could the death of the Queen affect the boundaries between English communities around the world? How could the death of the Queen affect the boundaries between English-speaking communities around the world? Well, I suppose it could go one of two ways. You know, one is that, and this would be a terrible thing, it's such, it's such bad timing in some sense, you know, I think, for, for what happened today to have happened. Um, I'm a great admirer of the, of the constitutional monarchy system. I think there's a wisdom about it, especially the way that your country has managed it, which is more, it's worked better than how any other country's managed it, maybe ever. That's really something. You know, there are obviously monarchical systems, constitutional monarchies still left in Europe, but they're kind of a pale reflection of what you've got in the UK. and. Uh, that's true. When Tammy and I were in Kentucky a couple of months ago, we, we were invited there by the former ambassador from the U.S. to Canada, and she was, and her husband were fundraisers for Donald Trump. Um, and he, he, he runs a coal mine, so <laughs> you can imagine why he's Republican. And, uh, and so we were, at, we were at the Kentucky Derby, which is quite the show. The Americans, they're very theatrical, man. They can put on a show like no one else. And the Kentucky Derby is definitely a show. People wear the most preposterous outfits, you know, these wild lime green suits and these amazing sort of Victorian costumes for the, for the women. And they're all dressed up. There's like 160,000 people at the racetrack. And it's quite the spectacle. And we were up above the racetrack, about three floors in this glassed-in cafe. And uh, the second day we were there, Trump was going to come to the cafe, to the restaurant. And uh, I had flown out that morning to give a commencement address at this conservative college in northern Michigan. And then I flew back. And uh, just after I got there, they closed the airport. So I just got in. They closed the airports because the president is coming to town, the former president. But they still call him the president. And so really, the whole city, in some real sense, was locked down. And then. I got to the Derby, back to the Derby, and just in time, because... It is crazy, because you think of... <clears throat> when was the last leader of a country that people give a shit about what he said on both sides? People are still disgusted by Trump's actions, just as if he is president, and people still want to know his opinion on things as if he is president still, like... Name me another leader that's had that. Ah, uh, because I don't know. I don't know one of our country, when they are out of power, that anyone gives a fuck about them. Still. Yeah, so Trump is unique in that way, I think. But yeah, let's go. We're going to lock down the whole derby. So that meant no one, 160,000 people, no one gets in or out. And then the army came in and there was like 300 guys in camouflage quite armed and they were taking up their stations and this is like three hours before Trump showed up and then the Secret Service came in and by that time I had made it upstairs to the restaurant where Tammy was and she'd been there uh, waiting and everyone was buzzing away about the fact that Trump was coming and the atmosphere was electric you know and I thought sitting there I thought this must have been what it was like to be well around the Kennedys say in the 1960s that level of fame I've been around famous people a lot now and there are definitely tiers of fame, you know. Mm. There's, there's not famous, and that's normal. And then there's 
celebrities that are maybe known locally and nationally, and then there are celebrities that are known internationally, and then there are celebrities like the Queen, who everyone everywhere in the world knows, who among famous people, they're hyper-famous, and Trump is in that category. And yeah. he's a very strange person in that category, I would say, because he's not just famous for being president, which is already something that makes you pretty damn famous, but he was really famous as a, as a businessman before that, and as a nouveau riche sort of businessman, and as a kind of brash entrepreneur and a character, and he was very famous for that. But then he got even more famous as a TV celebrity for like 15 years, and that's actually really hard, you know, regardless of what you think about it ethically, or you know, whether you think the kind of entertainment that he did, um, that he involved himself in was worthwhile. I don't care about that. that, that's not my point. My point is that managing that successfully for 15 years is exceptionally unlikely and difficult, and he was extremely famous as a consequence, and that was sort of laden on top of his fame for, on the business front, and then he became president. And so, that's a lot of fame, man. And when, when that much fame surrounds you, your life is very weird. And the probability that people are going to respond to you in, a normal, in the normal way that helps keep you sane is very low. Especially maybe if you're also an intimidating person to begin with, with a bit of a proclivity, let's say, towards disagreeableness. Because maybe then you chase away the people who would have enough mm -hmm. sense to tell you when you go a little bit too far. Anyways, we were up there in the restaurant, and the place was just buzzing, and then Trump came in, and it was, you could just feel the energy, the electric energy, and I thought, this is not good. This is too much, man. This is too much for anybody to bear. And the thing about the monarchy that's so cool, you know, in the United States, there's the judiciary and the legislative branch and the executive, that separation of powers, and the checks and balances that are part and parcel of that, and that's a bright system. And then you also have the states, and they have their power against the federal government, and that stops anything from becoming too tyrannical in principle. But here, and in Canada, although less so in Canada, because we're, you know, modern and trying to dispense with the monarchy, modern, confused, dim-witted, and untraditional, <laughs> um, and casual and careless, and then we have the French-English problem, which makes things more complicated on the monarchical front. Mm -hmm. You have four divisions. Yeah, really, Canada, Canada couldn't, like, pick two countries that, I mean, obviously, England, Britain, and France, or well, England and France haven't been to war for, for years, hundreds of years, I mean, with each other. But they're still, in this country, like an inherent dislike of the French and I think they have it towards us so to have them two in like them two ideologies and them two like in the same country yeah that's a that's a dangerous combination you have executive legislative um, judicial and symbolic and the monarch holds the symbolic weight. And that's really smart because it separates it to some degree from the political weight. You know, you see what happens in the United States is, well, first of all, is the president tends to turn into this, to the czar. You know, because they have this idea in the United States now, like first lady. It's like, what the hell is that? We don't have that in Canada. Nobody knows anything about, about Justin Trudeau's wife. And that's been the history of, of Canadian politicians. It's like, just because you're Justin Trudeau's wife doesn't mean you're queen. But in the United States, it's like, well, you know, Hillary Clinton, maybe she's queen. And that's, and that's partly because there is that demand for the symbolic weight that the leader should manifest. And you also see that to some degree in the United States, which is a star-worshipping culture, obviously, with the glitter. This is what's great about watching him. He says things and he's, he just go, yeah, I understand what he's saying, because it is, it's like... America has its royalty, the Clintons, the Bushes, whoever, that, that level of thing, like it does have a, what would be royalty, they're just not royalty, but they are the elite 
in America. Um, and yeah. So I see what you're saying. You do want, yeah. The presidents and that become kings and they're, yeah, that's crazy to think that because it's a, like a, a need for symbolism. That's crazy. The ratty and the royalty of Hollywood. And it's better put there. It's better put there in the entertainment section, even though that's also somewhat dangerous because it tends to elevate actors into pronouncements of ethical, ver pronouncers of ethical virtues, say. But better there than in the political realm. Trump, he's like king and president all rolled up into one. And that's just too much. And so, and so I really admire the monarchical system. And I think that for whatever reason, the UK has done a wonderful job of maintaining that. And I think a very economically canny job, too, because I know the economic analysis indicate that the royal family generates way more income than they spend. You know, because they're a major, and everything they're associated with here is a major tourist attraction. It's this tradition that you have here, this monarchical tradition, is something that's tremendously attractive to yeah. people who don't have that, Canadians. Honestly, I live near Windsor, and Windsor Castle obviously is one of the Queen's. Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle. Um, but if you go to Windsor, the majority of people that are there are there to see Windsor Castle. I've never been to Windsor Castle. I've barely even really been to Windsor. I've been to, there's a swimming pool. Windsor swimming pool, I used to go there. Um, but I've, I've never been in the castle, ever. And it's like literally on my doorstep pretty much. But if you go to Windsor, and Windsor's like, the high street is like a, just like a road going through the town, and it's like, but if you, the majority of people there are tourists, they're not from around here, like it's Japanese, or it's Americans, or it's like, and it's kind of crazy, because it's like, we kind of think, we don't get it as much, like, we don't understand but then I suppose it's just I suppose it's just that thing that you you're you're more impressed by I say America there's things in America that I would go to America to see 100% but there's, I don't think there's anything in this country but I, I guess it's just because it's here it's, it's just there so you just don't even think I guess but like yeah it does always surprise me like if I get the bus through Windsor um, it's just tourists it's people literal like tourists from movies like cameras around their neck and it's crazy so he's right yeah the, the, the royal family does bring a lot of um, and I don't know if that's going to last now because I think I mean how was how long was the Queen just 70 years or something, 70, 70 something years the Queen ruled, the longest ruling. So, like, she's connected to the British royal family and all the history. I mean, Game of Thrones is pretty much like <clears throat> the Lannisters and the Starks go into war, and that rivalry is based off the War of the Roses. Lancaster. Uh, or is it Lancashire, actually, Lancashire and York, which if you think of it, Lancashire, Lannister, uh, or is it Lancaster, it might be Lancaster, it's one of the two, see, fucking hell, that's how little, uh, yeah, I did learn it at school, but, but the other one is York, um, the other war, like, the end of War of Roses is York, and if you think York is Stark, and it's based around our history, so people are interested in it, and I think the Queen, she held such a big point because she's the longest serving of all of them. She's the long, well, reigning, not serving, but reigning, longest reigning queen. Um, so you have all that history, plus she's her own piece of history because she, out of all that history, was the longest running. But I think being passed down to Charles now, Yeah, I don't know if it would have the same f 
I don't know. Maybe it will. It's still the history, I suppose, but... Uh, I don't think they'll have the same attraction as they did with the Queen. I just, but no, you just don't know, do you? But anyway, yeah, let's go. Example, Americans. Because it's, it's just... It's so theatrical and so unique. And then you had Queen Elizabeth, who... Man, I mean, that's quite the woman there. What, how many, 13 prime ministers? And so you had someone around to intimidate all your prime ministers. That's a really good idea, and I'm sure she did a fine job of that, you know? And so, yeah. You know, and you, you, can, imagine, you can imagine how useful it was psychologically in some sense for the Prime Minister who has monarchical temptations in some sense like Trump did to have to go on a regular basis to this remarkable person who'd seen this immense span of political history and confess in some real sense right and to be subject to her cautious and wise judgment because I think she was a woman who was traditional and cautious and wise in the highest degree and there were scandals in her family but like you have a family if people knew what your family was doing don't you think there'd be scandals and so um, <laughs> but she was remarkably free of scandals over that entire period and that's that's a hell of a thing to manage for 70 years and so well so what will happen now well that the most likely thing is that your monarchy will d disintegrate like most of the other ones have. I, I'm not saying that will happen, I'm certainly not saying I want it to happen, but because that sort of thing is so hard to maintain, especially in the modern world, and because you need someone so remarkable to manage it, the probability that you'll get another one is relatively low. And so, I wish your new king the best, that's for sure. I will say no, because everyone was kind of a bit like, it was kind of a bit of a how is everyone going to take to him because people do still have in our country people still do have a thing against him over the whole Diana situation and uh, yeah there are people that still think they did it <laughs> they did it but um uh I will say that he has been. I mean, there's been just like him get him and them. What was it, um, Camilla? Welcomed with, and I think it's just how it is. It's that they are the royal family. So now he's king, and it's uh, people want to see it. Still, like the. It, there was there wasn't a bad turnout for him. Do you know what I mean? And and I thought there would be. I thought that people wouldn't be as interested. But there's this strange, strange devotion to the royal. But then I suppose it's what what he's saying that there is a um, a need for that in people. So that's why it's still here. And plus, I think as well as being British, we do anything that we're the best at. We'd like to hang on to. And I think that we, like he said, we do have a royal family that other royal families pale in comparison to. And I think that alone will make English people um, support them. But yeah, anyway, let's go. But you know, maybe, maybe you'll get lucky and maybe your monarch and maybe with your support will rise to the occasion and your country and the rest of the British Commonwealth will recognize that what they have in the shared bonds that unite them based on English common law and the great democratic tradition that's so much a function of this country and this country really in particular I mean you're the birthplace of both Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand, these, India these amazing countries, these free democratic productive, generous societies. It's quite the accomplishment. And I see in England and Europe, but... It is true. It's true how crazy... It's crazy how, like, it's only... It took me to... I, like, 
we actually get taught how the bad things our country did, but he's right. Every country that the British Empire um, touched is better off for it. Like, this is like, um, what's it, Hong Kong was British. Was it Hong Kong? And if you go there, they're like, like uh, anywhere else. But then if you go on the outskirts of China and around it, then it's not, it's nothing like that. Um, and it is true. It's like it took me to get older and to actually look into things myself to actually find out like the good that this country did actually do. Like, and it's crazy that we get taught in our schools about all the bad things only the bad things that the country did and like honestly we was pretty much taught to be ashamed of that being British was somehow bad and yeah it took me to get older where a lot of the modern world well the modern world how it is today <clears throat> America all of them as much as America says they're the leaders of the free world and they, they are now but the whole free world thing, it's like, you, you didn't go that far away from us. We've got Labour and Conservative. You've got Democrat and Republican. It's the same thing. You've got a two-party system, which was British. Every country, Britain, birthed, like he said, has that two-party political system. It has the kind of fairer laws to the to the best of whatever the country can come up with, but there's freedom in them countries. What's like, and it comes from it, and it's yeah, it's something that doesn't get said about this country, and and doesn't get. So it's kind of nice to hear someone say it, especially someone like Jordan Peterson, and it does, yeah. But I mean, it's nothing to well. It is my country, really. Um, but yeah I don't know I've never been one to kind of think that I did that do you know what I mean it's like I didn't do it no even if we did do the great things and we did set the world straight I didn't so I can't really get uh, yeah I suppose I can be proud of the country but yeah yeah but anyway yeah let's go in England too, in Great Britain, such a, such apprehension about that, such refusal to note the greatness of your country and its contributions. I mean, you know, no one in the United States ever talks about India, these amazing countries, these free, democratic, productive, generous societies. It's quite the accomplishment. And I see in England and Europe, but in England too, in Great Britain, such a such apprehension about that, such refusal to note the greatness of your country and its contributions. I mean, you know, no one in the United States ever talks about the fact that the UK was the country that, er that eradicated slavery. Like that's, that only happened once in the whole history of the, of the human race. You know, and your country did it. It took 175 years. And a, and a huge economic... I know, yeah, a massive war. We, uh, the truth is that is true, and that's funny how we get we like literally we got taught how our country enslaved people, and that our country should be guilty because we live off the benefits of slavery. But then you find out it was actually our country. This is what I mean. We didn't learn that in our schools. It took watching people on YouTube, historians who actually know the true thing, but in our schools, we don't get taught that. We get taught that England was just bad, we did bad things, and, and, and he's right. The UK or England stopped slavery in a war and to fight other countries that every other country had slaves. It wasn't even part of the human psychology to not have slaves until Britain and Britain fought a war by themselves to stop it. And here's a crazy fact for you. 
we've only just finished paying the debt of that um, of ending slavery in 2015 so think how long slavery was ended I mean America was a bit late behind the rest of the world to be fair like they fucking did it in put it this way England had pretty much banned slavery for the world about 700, 800 years before America did it. We did it in like the 12th century, so it was like 1140 something. Americans did it in what? 18 something, I don't even know, not even that. So yeah, it's, it's crazy how um, the, the UK, how we beat ourselves up. Like you said, there's a refusal to just, do, even good things we did, we can't say we did is this and it, we don't get taught that as English people it's like why wouldn't you get taught that in fact we got taught it took me to leave school to find out that England never actually had black slaves we learned about basically American black slavery as if it was our history so we all just grew up thinking that that we that England was exactly the same. We had slaves just exactly the same as America did. And it wasn't until you get older and yeah, actual historians actual historians say, no. It was William the Conqueror who stopped slavery, and well in England at that point in in England. In the um twelfth century, it was stopped, and it was. Here's a crazy story about that. When America had slaves around that time, it was wrote into the law of England that, by William the Conqueror, that any man, that England's heir is too pure to be breathed by a slave. Any man who steps foot on English soil is a free man by the law of the country. Any man. And there was a story, you can look this story up, of when America had slaves. An American bought black slave to England which you couldn't do we didn't have slaves but he brought a slave and um, I don't know whether the black man found out whether someone had told him but the black man ran away from his slave owner because he's in a free country now the only free country on the in the world that he could get away with this and he ran off the slave owner captured, got the black man captured, and because he'd run away, he was, they, like I said, this is how the fact that this American had brought that slave with him shows you how highly valued that slave was to that man. But because he ran away, he sold him, right? This is crazy. He sold him, shipped him away to sell him. It got back to the English. They stopped the man leaving, and a court and a um, a court case was held for the man for this case, and it was an American has bought a slave in his country is his property in our country. We don't have that. He sold it from our shores, and the uh, black man won because the laws of our country despite whatever country you come from or whatever rules you live by in our country if you step foot on English soil you're, you're a free man you cannot be owned by anybody even if you are owned in another country and brought here you're free and the black man um, won the case and not only that but the money for his lawyers was put up by local English people that had heard about the case. Obviously this slave had no money, because he was a slave. So how the fuck could he fight this man who had money in a case? Well, local English people donated him money to get a lawyer to fight the case. But yet we still have to listen to how racist and hateful our country is, even to this day, and it's just like, yeah, it's sad really. Because someone said 
English historian said basically no matter what the two well it'll be, he said two pages I think the pages in the, the purest pages in English history will be um, the ending of slavery for the world and that will be that will never be forgotten by the world and that that is what when the British Empire falls and crumples the legacy of the British Empire will be no more slavery and isn't it even funny? Isn't it funny that the British Empire isn't even gone yet, and people don't know that? Like, it's crazy that people did fucking forget that was meant to be the legacy. That was why the empire did it, because that was meant to be after everything. They did that for the world, and then they're not remembered for it. It's crazy. It's crazy. But anyway, yeah, that's great. Well, here's another thing, just a little fact as well. When when the when we was conquering Africa, we made them stop selling slaves. We made it so Africa could no longer enslave their own people and sell them. And the African leaders and the leaders of yeah, all over there, they come back and said, "We will meet every demand that the British uh, demands of us." but we won't stop slavery because it's a part of the culture to it's something to be proud of to capture your enemy and enslave him it's a sign of like it's an achievement and that was what came back when England gave the demands to Africa of the new rules of the new world and what they'll live by so that's another thing again England's so racist and crazy and Africa's so great, but they didn't want to give up slavery. They did not want to give up slavery. It, England forced them to, so yeah, let's go. And that is all fact. Like, I'm not making that up. You can go and fucking Google that shit. It's all fact. Everything I just said. Yeah. No, it was it was your country and the great people who were were spearheading that movement at the time that established once and for all on the political and economic front that that was not to be tolerated. And then you know it took a while for that idea to spread everywhere. It still hasn't because there's there's plenty of slaves in the world. The estimate's 30 million at the moment, by the way. Uh, but there are very few people who will come out forthrightly and say that it's that it's right, that it's okay, that, you know, might makes right. And your country was definitely one of the moral forces in the world, the primary moral force on the political front, who established once and for all that that was no longer acceptable. And so, and, 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 and yet, mostly what characterizes a fair bit of self-image in Great Britain is shame. And, you know, every country has things to be ashamed of, but not every country also has things to be proud of. So, so what do we think? What's going to happen with the Commonwealth? Well, maybe we'll wise up and recognize that we have something absolutely precious to guard. And... Uh, and then maybe we'll guard it. But to do that, we're going to have to defend ourselves against unwarranted accusations of, of guilt. Not that there's not something to be guilty about, you know, because we're all the beneficiaries of the atrocities of history. And we have to atone for that in our personal behavior. But by the same token, man, you're supposed to separate the wheat from the chaff and not just call it all chaff. And when you look at your own history, you think, we stumbled plenty, you know, but we still walked uphill. And you, in your country, you can say that more than most.
Yeah. Yeah, I knew that would be good now. Because Jordan Peterson's just great and he just puts things in such a great way. And I think that with him saying there's a there's a kind of a need for a lot and I do think the same with religion. I think religion is just as vital for a society and I think the fact that we are losing religion is not good for our society. It's one of the basic bases of society. And yeah, so is the royal family or a monarchy or something. Like he said, it's, he just sums it up so perfectly. It's something above, even though, to be honest, the Queen can't make laws. She doesn't actually have power, but she, like he said, she has that aura of who she is. And I've seen her, like there is a clip of her going to the Bank of England. And I think wanting to see the one of the Rockefellers or something like that. And they'd flown out the morning that they knew she was coming. They'd flown out of England. And the Queen was like, well, I want to see him, basically. Right? And she was basically saying, I want to know why no one's got money in this country. How is that possible? Because obviously... They get the taxpayers' money. They get taxpayers' money to exist. So if the country's not doing well, they ain't doing well. Which is kind of a good thing. That their main income is off of the people. Because they they ha they then have to keep the people earning and paying and contributing a certain amount for their own necessity too. Which I've never thought of that actually, that's a great thing. To have them that, yeah. Yeah, I've never actually thought about these things as much. I have thought about the history, but all this history and that, I've, like I say, it's the things I've learned history, uh, recently. Never learned it in history. Um, yeah. And he's right, it, he's right, we have that. So any Americans watching, and you've got guilty white people, we have the same thing. People that are ashamed. Uh, oh yeah, of this country and it like, and I used to be one. I used to be one, but the, but the people were like that because they're being taught that and it's, and it's not true. I mean, like he said, there's things, yeah, that you can be ashamed of. There's, there's horror stories from the, even what the British did to the Irish. Like we don't really know nothing about that battle like the Irish have a real grudge of, against us for it but we don't know nothing about that we don't talk about that but I watched some IRA person t talking about what what the British special force or not special forces but secret services that would do to them the torture techniques that they would use and, and it's fucking brutal there's no denying, so that's even to Ireland, what they did to people in Ireland, so fuck knows what they did around the rest of the world, but, but like he said, you can't take the bad and say it's all bad, and ignore the good, because of what the good, without a doubt, um, the good that the British Empire did, far outweighs it, the it's like what would you rather the British Empire never existed and slavery still exists and you think there's no America there's no Canada there's no Australia there's no all these countries that the British Empire reached to there's none of that without it Yeah, made me oddly patriotic, which is kind of strange for a Canadian to make you feel patriotic. But I think it's just because he, you can tell he, he's just a smart motherfucker, Jordan Peterson. He just puts things in such a great way that even I can understand it. But anyway, yeah, that's the reaction. Sweet.